Hey everyone, I'm gonna wait a little bit till people come in. I'm trying to do this a little bit earlier just in case there are some people that are in other countries that are night owls and are still up. Hi Eric. Hi Jennifer. Hey you guys, oh boy, a bunch of you jumped on pretty quick. That's good. So I don't have to sit here and stare at the camera. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right in. I don't wanna be a lot of time, and I say that every time I end up talking way more than I planned on. So hopefully this won't take very long. It is only, I don't know what I think. It's only two, essentially two pages long. So not, not very long, but it's what's in there that's important. Hi guys, thanks for joining me. Hi, Marilyn, I hope you're doing okay. Okay, so I'm gonna start. I have quite a few people here already. Okay, so as everybody knows, Kathleen filed another letter with the court today that is essentially supplementing her reply to the motion to stay and remand. Okay, now, ever since she filed the motion for the testing and the issue first came up about what was in queso about returning the bones to the Halbach family. Um, I had said since then that even before she filed the, the second motion, that the pelvic bone would be the most critical for them to, to, you know, to make sure that they still had, because first off, that's the bone that she wants to test, obviously. But when you're talking about a violation of any kind, you know, if they got rid of that, that is the best chance. That bone is the best chance of winning any type of claim, whether it be a statutory violation or a, a due process violation under the case law. So when she filed the motion, uh, when she received the, the, doc, the, the two pages from Queso showing that they got rid of the, the bones or disposed of the bones, she filed this motion essentially demanding, where are these? Do you have them? Do you not have them? Um, you were supposed to keep them. Okay. And I noticed right away, and I, I don't think a lot of people noticed right away, because every time I talk to somebody about it, they seemed a little confused about what I was talking about. The, the pelvic bones were included in the case of report as bones that were returned, but they weren't included in the, in the um, original motion um, for the due process violation. Okay, it wasn't one of the tag numbers that was included. And right away that confused me because now here she's presenting this claim of, you know, a viol that they violated his rights and she wasn't including to me what was the most important bone <laughs> to, that, that they needed to have. So I was a little confused by that. I didn't, so, always, always, without fail. Justice, stop it. She just knows. I don't know how she knows. But, okay, the reason why the pelvic bone is so important, okay, is that, number one, I mean, that's the bone that she wants to get tested, obviously, because, you know, that's probably, that was probably the, probably the best bone as far as being able to do any type of testing on. It might have been the most intact bone, or at least, sorry, I wish I could mute her. <laughs> Can't, though. <laughs> so, um, but the pelvic bone was the only one of all those bones that were returned to the family that was actually presented during trial. And that's why it's the most important one because that was the bone that was in the trial first off, but it was also the bone that, uh, the, the defense made very clear was important to them they wanted to try to establish that it belonged to Teresa because it essentially just blows the state's theory of what happened out of the water. And Ken Kratz himself had said repeatedly, like, I'm only going to spend 20 seconds on this because it's not important. Well, he wanted to downplay it because they kept saying that she never left the property or at least everything they presented suggested that, you know, they had Bobby testify, testified that, you know, she never left the property. You know, she was killed in the garage. You know, she was held in the trailer, you know, supposedly. Um, but she was killed in the garage. She was burned in the burn pit. 
at what time did she supposedly leave the property? They didn't want to put that image in the jurors' minds. And so that's why Kratz just tried to just dismiss it and not even bring it up. But it was very clear that it was important to the defense to identify that bone if possible. Okay, so when you're talking about both a statutory violation and a due process violation under the Constitution, whether it be the state Constitution or the U.S. Constitution, um, you have to you have to essentially they have to think that it had some kind of value okay and it's hard to say that with any bones that weren't actually used in the trial they you know we don't even know how big some of these bones are they're fragments they're chips at some of them so we don't even know but we knew that this bone was important and we knew all the way back when kathleen filed her original motion for scientific testing that she was interested in testing this bone she brought it up again during um, in her original post conviction petition, that it was something she wanted to test, and or, or actually she brought it up I think as an IAC claim that the defense didn't have it tested at the time. They just relied on Eisenberg's testimony, and that was it. They didn't do any testing of their own. So I think that's when she brought it up there, and then she made that agreement with Fallon, which is important. She mentions this in this motion on was it September eighteenth I think in two thousand seventeen. Before the court made a decision, she made this agreement with Fallon, and that was one of the bones that was going to be, or one of the items that was going to be tested. Two weeks later, um, the court ruled, and that essentially gave her no chance to be able to test them because now it was essentially case closed at the circuit level. Now, there was a two week gap there. Okay, so. I know I was talking to somebody today about, you know, like, well, it's kind of suspicious. Like, because one of the things we've been asking is, well, why would Fallon agree to this testing if he didn't know the, if he knew that the bone wasn't there? And he should know because he was part of the group that decided that it was okay to dispose of it and give it back to the family. It says that in Queso. So, how did he not know? Now, it's possible, I mean, my memory certainly is not great, so it's possible that maybe he wasn't sure, he couldn't remember if that was one of the bones they gave away or not, but again, wouldn't he have checked before he agreed to, to allow her to do testing? He had to remember they gave away something. You know, it was, I mean, yeah, it was six years ago, but, you know, at the time, but still, you know, it was like, you, you should have remembered that you gave away something to the family. So why wouldn't you at least check? to find out if you still have it before you decide to make this agreement. So one of the things that came up was, well, did the court rule quickly just because Fallon screwed up and he didn't want the testing done? And I get it, you know, it's, you know, it's a little conspiracy theorist, but they had no, no idea that Kathleen would not notify the court about the agreement. If Kathleen had notified the agreement right when it happened, it would have been a done deal and they, they, they would have had to turn over that stuff for testing. So they really couldn't count on her not notifying the court in those two weeks. So I just, I don't buy that. I still don't. But it still does beg the question, why did Fallon agree to this? I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling to me. My thought was that when Kathleen filed the original motion, not, you know, the motion for the, um, the due process claim, or the, I'm sorry, the, the stay to file the due process claim, that maybe at that point, because of that, she assumed that bone was still in custody. Now, even that argument is a little weak because it said in case so that it wasn't. It was one of the bones included that they said that they gave away. But it seems like she must have believed that they did have still have that based on the fact that he made this agreement to test it. And it wasn't until the evidence ledgers came out that she realized it had the same notation as the other bones that she knew were disposed of. And so then there's this question. It's like, well, you, you know, obviously you said you multiple times, you know, I brought up that I want to test these bones and you've never once told me that you didn't have it in custody. Okay. So it's important because of the fact that under the state statute, we've gone over this a lot. Everybody should know by heart by now is that, you know, that the bones have to be identifiable to the victim. We know it doesn't fall in that category. or um, law enforcement, um, basically it says that, was it reasonable 
for law enforcement to conclude that it had no future potential exculpatory value. The key word in there is exculpatory. That's kind of, that's where the gray area comes in here. And I'm not sure what they're gonna do with that, but, but it was potentially important for a, at the very least, okay? Fallon himself said in one of his letters, I think it was April, 2017, can't remember for sure, but he said in one of his letters that this specific tag number, meaning this bone that she wanted testing, had at least some apparent relevance. He admitted it. He admitted that it was relevant. And again, he, you know, he said he'd consider letting her testing at that point. So how can the state say that it was re reasonable for them to conclude that it had no possible exculpatory value and they were able to dispose of it by law? It's a really hard argument to make just because of this specific bone. Again, it was at the trial. It was important to the defense. They knew the defense wanted to try to tie it to Teresa. They knew that, I mean, again, you have got Norm Gahn involved here. I mean, like the king of DNA in the state. Um, he had to know that technology was gonna catch up with it someday, that maybe they could, they, they might not have been able to identify it at the time, but he would never think that it wouldn't be possible in the future because of what he does. And he's always been this champion for DNA testing and, and preserving biological material. So under the statute, it's very hard for, it would have been harder for Kathleen to win under that statute if they still had the pelvic bone. But if they, but if they don't, that is a lot better case for winning a statutory violation. Now we're still dealing with the issue of the fact that under the statute, there's no remedy provided. Okay, it's essentially never come up before. It came up in that one case that's unpublished, can't be used, can't be cited, where they said, well, since there's no relief listed, then you're not entitled to any. Okay, I do not see them trying to do that with this case. It, it would be a nightmare if they tried to skirt the issue like that. It really would be. It would just be, the optics would be terrible and I just don't see them hunting, you know, on this, this issue with this case, because all eyes are on them. Okay. Yeah, can you get her, please? <laughs> Thank you. I don't know why she's like that. Now, when it comes to the case law, it's important, because as I've talked about before, when the evidence is potentially exculpatory, they have under young blood, there's this bad faith requirement. And again, the state of Wisconsin has never ruled that any evidence has been disposed of in bad faith ever. They always say it's negligent, incompetent, whatever, but not, not bad faith, which I don't really understand. Like, so it's okay that they're just incompetent, negligent. That's okay when you're handling evidence. I just think it sends a really bad message. I mean, it shouldn't, it shouldn't matter. Your, you know, how it was disposed of or the frame of mind of the person disposing it, that shouldn't change whether it violates your, your right to due process. One shouldn't have anything to do with the other, but it does, unfortunately. I hope that's something they change eventually because it's stupid, <laughs> if you ask me. When it comes to Arizona versus Youngblood, okay, they have this bad faith requirement. And again, kind of a mountain to climb here because it's never been ruled that way before. But when you take into account again, all of the facts surrounding this particular bone that Fallon has agreed to the testing, he has never given any indication that they didn't have it. He should have known since he was part of the team that disposed of it. It would be again, very hard to say that they acted in good faith when disposing of this bone. I mean, he was the trial attorney or one of the trial attorneys. So again, he can't say, well, I didn't remember it being in the trial. Again, you know, it's like, it would just all be so disingenuous that I don't see how any court could actually, well, I can see, I shouldn't say that. It's just that this is a stronger argument. So now there are two sides to this whole thing. You know, it's like, there's the bad part where, well, they don't have the bone, can Kathleen even test it. She clearly wants to test it to prove that she left the property because that could prove to be relevant in blowing their case out of the water. 
Okay. Now, chain of custody has come up so much from people. Okay. The law in Wisconsin says if chain of custody is broken in this type of circumstance, the results of the testing themselves can prove the integrity of the evidence. So Kathleen was to get the bones from the Halbach family. She's saying she, she suspects that they were buried. She said that in the Q&A yesterday. That was true when she was able to convince a court to exhume them and she wanted to test them. Her theory is that they belong to Teresa. So if the test results come back and they are Teresa's, that confirms that the evidence was not tampered with. So it's admissible in a court of law. It doesn't matter that chain of custody was broken because the test results show what they should show or what they're hoping to show. Now that means you're a little bit screwed if it doesn't show what you want it to show. If they're inconclusive or anything, you can't prove that it wasn't tampered with. There's nothing you can do about it other than possible, um, just, you know, visual, you know, just looking at it and seeing, does this look like the same bone, you know, um, just on a visual evaluation of what the bone looks like, what it looked like before from photographs, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to keep this kind of not from jumping around, but you know me, I do that. When it comes to um, the other part that people have said, and when I say people, I mean like builders, <laughs> usually they'll say, well, you know, like, well, so what if she left the property? It doesn't prove that Steve didn't kill her. And that's, that's unfortunately true. That's why I say the word exculpatory, it's kind of a gray area though, because it doesn't actually, even if it's Teresa, it doesn't prove that Steve's innocent. Okay. But that's not the issue at hand. The issue is, was the trial fundamentally fair? Without this being presented, did the jury hear the proper facts in order to properly um, reach a verdict? Okay, so it's not really about proving his innocence with this. Okay, it's unfortunate because I wish it did, but it doesn't but that's not what's at issue. It's, it's about how fair was the trial if you can prove this was Teresa's and the state alleged that she never left. Okay. Now, some people have said like, well, the state can just say, well, he took some of the bigger bones out of the burn pit and he put them in the barrel and they dumped them out the quarry and he left some in the barrel. And first off, seriously. Okay, let's just move past the ridiculousness of that for a second. It becomes very convenient for the state that no photographs were taken of the bones as they sat in the burn pit. Because you know what? That would be really good information to have to know if that theory even holds water or not. Because we don't know. We don't know how big the bones were that were sitting in the burn pit. We don't know how many big bones were moved, how many big bones were left behind. We really don't know. And why? Because nobody bothered to take any pictures. Again, a little convenient there. So. I would say that you still have a hard time making that argument because first off, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And second of all, you, you don't have any more proof of it than you did that, you know, Steve burned her behind the garage. There just, there isn't enough proof. You're just speculating at that point. Now, granted, you can speculate all you want during a trial, you know, I mean, because it's just a matter of whether the jury believes it, but there's so much publicity with this case that, you know, it's going to be hard to find a jury that's going to say like, oh, we never heard any of this before. You know, so, I mean, right now, since we're talking about a constitutional violation, you know, we're looking for at a retrial, you know, that's it. They're not going to just declare him innocent and let him go. We're looking at a retrial. So it's very important to know what would be in the jury's minds if there were to be a retrial and what could happen with respect to that. Um, I know there's something. I didn't write any notes today, and this is what happens. I can't remember where I wanted to go. I'm just going to look through the, this quick. Um, first off, I probably shouldn't even say this, but Kathleen addresses the dear justices. Okay, no justices in the Court of Appeals. Judges. <laughs> Maybe she's working with the Supreme Court and, you know, on another case, and she forgot. Because, yeah, justices are Supreme Court. So just pointing that out. Nobody else probably notices that but me. Okay, so now we're going to get to this phone call. Now, by itself, looking at what the phone call says, I think everybody has read it by now probably, it's in the group if you haven't, that Mark Williams, who was, was he just co-counsel, I believe? Yeah, yeah, he's co she calls him um, Fallon's co-counsel. He is attempting to call Fallon and tell him, 
don't respond to her, her messages she's been leaving you, until we have a chance to go and look in the evidence bag to see what's actually there. And people kept saying a bag, well, yeah, they put all the evidence in bags. Sometimes it's a clear plastic evidence bag, sometimes it's a brown paper bag. I actually looked in, in Queso real quick and yeah, it, this, it says that it was put in a clear plastic bag, whether that is how it stayed or it got transferred, but yeah, they're in a bag. They're all in a storage locker of some sort, but they're housed in a bag. So Williams is saying that he wants to look in this bag to see if it's there before they respond. And I don't blame them because you certainly don't want to say, oh, we have it when you don't. So I don't think the phone call itself is really bad. I don't, you know, um, but what's, what's important about it is the fact that clearly Fallon is dodging Kathleen. He doesn't want to answer this phone call. He doesn't want to answer this message. Now, again, Williams might need to go to the evidence locker and look to see if the bone's there, Fallon should know. And even again, if he had forgotten, the minute this came up again, you really think he's not making phone calls or going there himself to see if that bone is there or not? Come on. You know, like, this, this could end up being the thing that could overturn Steve's conviction. So you know damn well he was looking into whether these bones were there or not. So again, it's it's like a little funny that they're trying to sit there and say that, you know, like, oh, we need to check. Ah, Fallon knows. He knows it's, if it's there or not. Is that if he didn't remember, he's already looked. So the fact that he's dodging Kathleen is interesting to me. Because clearly it's a question he does not want to answer. Okay, and why wouldn't you want to answer that question? You know, it's a pretty simple yes or no question. Why don't you want to answer it? Um, and then really there's not much else here other than, you know, she, she mentions that she's attached to CD, which is a recording of the phone call. And she, she really goes hard at Fallon about how he misrepresented himself and the state's position when he said they had this phone and when he said that he would allow them to test it. And, you know, he's, she's essentially saying that, you know, that enough is enough. I feel like I'm getting the runaround from these from you guys on everything. I feel like everything is a lie. Every time I see some document, it's different than what you have. Everything I've been given is different than what you actually have. Why are there all these issues? And the phone call, other than being a little hilarious, because oh my god, seriously, how do you do that? I mean, when you call, doesn't it say like Kathleen on it? I'm pretty sure it doesn't say Tom Fallon when she answers the phone or when the voicemail answers the phone. Like oh. How out of it are you that you can't even remember who you're calling or you don't notice that when you call somebody? And I know it's serious, but come on. There's a lot in this case that if it wasn't so tragic, it would be comical. Everybody always says you can't make this stuff up. And it's like, are you kidding me? Why is there an issue with everything? And I actually said to somebody last week, I think, I said that it's sad that people can be wrongfully convicted in this country. It's even more sad that they can be convicted by a bunch of imbeciles. Oh. Yeah, see, Justice agrees. <laughs> She's growling. <laughs> it's true, though. It, when I first saw this phone call, it was just like, how? I can't be the only one that sat there and thought, how did they ever get a conviction against these two? Not to mention the fact that they were given awards, awards for their work on this case. Those, but whoever gave them those awards needs to ask for them back because it's an embarrassment. You have, you know, the documentation is always shoddy. The, these evidence ledgers are a huge just example of that. I can't remember what tag number it was now that I just happened to pick and was following. And I was like, there's two times it was taken out of evidence, never recorded. It was put back two times. It's kind of like the signing logs at the, at the yard with Ryan and Scott Bladorn. It's like, Okay, you left, but when did you go in? You know, it's the same thing. It's like you, you took it out of evidence twice, but when was it put back in? Or, you know, or no, it was returned twice, but when did you take it out? You know, they had, it was listed on two different ledgers, and the reasoning for taking it out was different depending on which ledger you were looking at, which page you were looking at. Um, on one ledger, it said that it was returned by um, Reamer on December 19th. On the other ledger page, it said it was returned by Reamer on December 20th. 
It's ridiculous. It's lazy. It's stupid. It's sloppy. And there's absolutely no excuse for it. And we see it with everything in this case. And that in a much less wordy way is exactly what Kathleen is trying to say. She's saying, I've had it. I've had it with all of this, this crap, you know, that you keep trying to, you know, throw at me. You know, it's like every day it's something else. And, and she just doesn't want, she wants somebody to do something about it. She wants the court to finally do something about it. And that's, I mean, that's really all this is, you know, and so she's trying to say that, you know, again, this increases the chances of there being a statute. She's not spelling this out, but I'm spelling it out that this increases the chance of a statutory violation. It increases the chance of saying that they acted in bad faith because how can Fallon know that it was used during. Okay. I'm sorry. She's trying to. <laughs> she does this when I'm on the phone, Steve. <laughs> he, he, said, he, always, he says it all the time. He said, you can tell she's an Avery. She's feisty. <laughs> And she's stubborn, and she's determined, and she never gives up, as you will see. So, she, yeah, she definitely lives up to her Avery name. <laughs> so, I'm so sorry. I don't know why she does this. <coughs> but, again, it, it, it goes towards bad faith because, again, how can you say he acted in good faith when he knew it was presented at trial? He knew that it was a, a point in the defense. He himself says in a letter that he thinks it has apparent relevance. Some. He said it was minimal but who cares? He still said it had some apparent relevance. Okay, he agrees to, well, first he says that they'll, they'll evaluate and consider doing the testing. Well, then he agrees to do the testing. And then she files the, the, the motion for the, the testing. And the, even then they didn't say anything about not having any of those bones. They argued against the it, it procedurally saying it was procedurally not allowed to remand the case. So now she files this one for the due process violation and they still argued it on procedure saying why, you know, it shouldn't be remanded. So again, it, I know that they've never ruled a bad faith case in Wisconsin or even in this district or, or this circuit, I should say. Seventh circuit really hasn't either. Um, but And what I mean, you might, I mean, they've already said in some of the courts when there's been a dissension from some of the judges on these bad faith cases, they've said that the bar is just almost insurmountable because they've basically said unless law enforcement gets up on the stand and admits they they destroyed it out of malice, they're not doing anything about it. But again, there's a lot of eyes on this case. Um, there's a lot of suspicious things. So I'm not going to write it off um, because something's got to change. It has to. It absolutely has to change. And maybe this is the case to do it because this is the case that's very high profile and everybody's watching. Now, without the pelvic bone, sorry, I don't think that she'd have much of a chance of winning the due process claim because they could easily just say, we had no idea that, you know, since the trial, nobody has, like, even during the trial, nobody requested any testing of those bones. Again, this is aside from the pelvic bone. Um, post-conviction, direct appeal, Steve's pro se petition, nobody ever brought those bones up. Okay, so the, the, the state could easily just say, like, how are we supposed to know they, that it could still possibly be significant when nobody has ever expressed any interest in these bones whatsoever? And so that's why it's it, that's why this is so important, knowing, and I'm just happy I have my answer because I, it was driving me crazy. I couldn't understand why she didn't have it in the motion. <laughs> I was like, that's the most important bone. Why isn't it in there? So I'm glad that she's actually asking. And like I said, it's bad they don't have it as far as the testing goes. But as far as winning a due process claim, it's actually good they don't have it. You know, so it depends on which way you want to go. I mean, I guess if we knew the test results ahead of time, we'd know which would be the better answer. Clearly, if we know they're going to be Teresa's, then you'd want it to be the testing to be done. If we knew it was going to be inconclusive, then I'd say, well, thanks for getting rid of them and giving them a possible due process claim. Uh, I think that's really about it. So I'm going to go. I know there's lots of questions. So I'm just going to go scroll through here now. And it only lets me go back so far. I hate that. So anybody with questions that asked earlier, sorry, I can't see them. So either ask again or I will just answer them when I get when I'm done. 
I do not why, know why it doesn't let me go back. It's so dumb. Um, yeah, Wieger, Wiegert's signature is on queso. Uh, I mean, he's, and his signature is on the evidence ledgers. And I think everybody knows by now that it's very strange that in every other situation where they gave something to the family, whether it be to Chuck, things that belong to the Avery family, or the Hallbachs, one of them signed for it. Karen Hallbach signed for it or Chuck signed for it. Yet these bones, nobody signed for it. At the very least, the funeral home should have signed, saying that they accepted you know, the bones and that it was no longer in police custody. But they did that in other places too. Every time something was removed for court, there's no notation saying it was put back in evidence. <laughs> Nothing. So, and some of them, the last notation is like for court. That's it. Well, what happened to it? Did you throw it away after court? What, what did you do with it? And some of them are kind of ridiculous anyway, because why would you need like the actual swabs and things for court? You only need the reports. So everything is weird in there. Like I still want to know why Dave Remaker had to take out dog feces from evidence and then not say what he was doing with it. Just saying. Um, yeah, I find it odd that he left a voicemail. Again, it's just comical. It's like, how can you be that clueless? Uh, okay, thanks, Travis. Yeah, you know, we still don't know. I mean, everything about the pelvic bone, the evidence suggests they do not have it. I don't think Fallon would be dodging Kathleen if they did have it. And again, I, I just don't see any way that the court can say, nope, we're not going to remand this case because, hello, I mean, that's a pretty significant thing to just dispose of with no hearing, no, no reason to find out why or anything. <clears throat> well, that's the thing. Was he deliberately misleading Kathleen when he agreed to the testing? That's what we don't know. Because it seems stupid. Because again, when he made the agreement for the testing, if Kathleen had notified the court, the decision would have been put on hold and he would have had to come up with that evidence for her to test. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that he would agree to testing and know he didn't have that stuff in custody. But it also doesn't make a lot of sense that if he wasn't sure when he was part of disposing the bones that he wouldn't double check just to see. You know, again, do I, I mean, I say that phrase multiple times a day. It just doesn't make any sense. I'm sure most of you do too because it's a common thing you hear every day. So there's nothing, nothing makes sense in this case. You're wondering who ties Fallon and Gunn's shoes in the morning. Yeah, they. Yeah, she's, maybe they need Velcro, or maybe they have Velcro. They probably do. Okay. Just as feisty as Zellner today. Yeah, she must know something's going on. She's just all worked up. All worked up today. So crazy. She's so angry. She's an angry puppy right now. That's her. That's her. That's her uncle Steve. <laughs> I always tease Steve that we're related by dog, which we are. But um, yeah, she wants, that's her name. Her name says it all. She wants justice. It's funny when I do these videos and I talk about justice and she, she always looks at me like she thinks I'm talking to her. Yeah, even the dog is pissed off about it. Yep, she knows what's what. Do you think he set, left the voicemail on purpose to set it up to make it appear they didn't know the bones were in the, no. Nobody is going to want to look that incompetent. <laughs> I mean, it's a joke. It really is. And no, they wouldn't do that. They can just say that they didn't know. But they can't, you know, I mean, they really, they can say it. it. It wouldn't hold much weight or carry much weight because all their evidence and their documentation says otherwise. Oh, I, yeah, Jennifer, I love that too. The very first thing that Kathleen says in the motion was that I'm not apologizing. <laughs> because in general, I had mentioned this before, that you know, on most motions there, you file the motion and then there's a response and then there's a reply. Done. That's it. And then she files this letter that's essentially a supplement. And the reason she's filing it as a letter is because you really can't file anything else. You're not supposed to. And then she does it again. And so procedurally, we are just throwing the whole thing out the window right now. Um, but that also means that if she can file these letters, the state probably can too, you know, that they can respond to a letter. They wouldn't be able to respond to her reply, but they can. So when they're talking about responding to her, I assume they're talking about 
her emails that she sent, but they could be referring to responding to the court. But it would be in no way to their benefit to respond to the court if they don't have those phones. Because that's not something they have to admit to until the motion for the due process claim is filed. Because remember again, this is only a motion to remand the case. It's you're not deciding the merits of the due process violation. Okay, you're only deciding whether you have enough information or if there's enough there to warrant more fact finding in the circuit court. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, so I just I say the same thing. I just really like that in the beginning. She's like, I am not apologizing because I am done with these people. <laughs> and I am tired of getting new documents that I think that I have. And then I find out that they're not complete. You know, and so, I mean, yeah, so that's why it was funny that she was like, I'm not apologizing. She's not even giving them a chance to like yell, reprimand her. She's like, no, not apologizing. Just putting that out right now. Uh, yeah, just as Casey's teeny. She went to go get a drink now. Yeah, she's tired from all this feistiness. Well, okay, so, um, yeah, we were talking about that there are several components. Now, only only three pieces of the pelvic bone were presented at trial. It was the two, um, was it, is it the iliac? I can't remember. I never, you know, my daughter is the anatomy person, not me. But it was the two sides and then essentially the sacrum that put, holds them together. Yeah, I think it was the iliac on both sides and then the sacrum. So, but it, can, it constitutes part of a, a pelvic bone. Again, it's not very clear exactly what they got rid of. You know, did they get rid of all of everything that was related to the pelvic bone? Did they get rid of a piece of it? And that's important too. And this is another reason why the pelvic bone is important is because if they still had it in custody, one of the things that the case law says under Greenwald is that there's a violation when it's you know, apparently exculpatory, whether apparently or potentially, and the evidence can't be, the, or no comparable evidence can be tested. Now, originally when we thought all those bones were given away, yeah, it matters because, well, there's no comparable evidence. If you gave everything away from the quarry, which is where we're interested in, well, there's no, nothing comparable to test. But if they still had the pelvic bone, that argument is just, again, it's a moot point because the pelvic bone is obviously comparable evidence because that was found in the quarry. So you can test that. Uh, what is it about that first sentence where she said she won't apologize? She's just essentially saying she's not going to apologize for essentially like filing another letter <laughs> um, with, with this motion. You know, she's not, she's, there's not, she doesn't want the court to say that, get annoyed. She's basically saying like, you don't get to get annoyed with me or irritated with me for all these filings because it's not my fault that they just keep springing things on me I didn't know. So that's essentially all she's doing. Yeah, it's hard to get the truth out when the courts are not impartial. But again, you know, and Kathleen covered this a lot in the Q&A yesterday, and then the Court of Appeals has not really decided anything. They haven't even had a chance to review the case yet because it hasn't been briefed yet. So, I mean, you know, don't give up on the Court of Appeals. You really, we really have no idea where they're going to fall on this issue or on any of this, on any of Steve's entire case. We don't know. And we don't want to make, you know, we don't want to make snap judgments. I know, I mean, I know it's hard not to because nothing goes our way, but we don't know yet. I have no idea. The pelvic bone might be in the evidence bag. Right, because that's what Williams is actually saying. He's like, well, let's go look in the bag and see what's there and what's not before we respond because again they certainly it would look terrible for them to tell her in writing that they have it and then they go later and look and they don't that would look even worse so they don't i said they're not they don't have to respond they don't have to defend themselves they don't have to say yes we have it in custody but if they did i would certainly say that right now but if they don't they do not have to put that out there yet you know now the court may ask them and then they would I mean, Kathleen's not entitled to an answer. Okay, she's, she's not. I mean, they don't have to tell her everything, you know, but the court would most likely say, well, we need to know. Do you have this or not? Okay, so, I mean, it's usually lawyers try to work together so that you don't have to make these kinds of filings. Like, if, if Fallon had answered her, she probably still would have filed a supplement of some kind because the pelvic bone, again, was not included in the motion. She wants to make sure that gets added. But it probably wouldn't have been as hostile if Fallon had been up front with her. 
So usually, you know, I said, usually lawyers try to work together. They try to communicate because you don't want to be hashing everything out in the, in the courtroom because the judges can get annoyed. But in this case, she's just like, you're not going to answer me. Fine. I'm just going to put it in the court and they'll make you answer me. Uh, am I related to the Avery's? No, I thought everybody knew this by now. No, my dog justice is, um, her parents are Chuck's dogs. So Chuck's puppies, her, his chihuahuas had a litter of pups and, um, I have one of them justice. So that's why I joke that we're related by dog. Yeah. So we always say she's an Avery cause she's just feisty and stubborn and she, she, <laughs> She has a big mouth and she likes to use it. So, anybody that knows Steve knows that's him. <laughs> He's not afraid to talk. Um, yeah, there seems like there's so many outs with the law. Um, yeah, I mean, I always say this to people. I said, the one thing you have to remember is that, especially in the appellate system, it's not designed to make it easy for prisoners to get out of prison. And in most cases, we're happy about that. We want that. You know, we don't want to make it easy for people, but it's really bad when you talk about people who have been wrongfully convicted. In Wisconsin, they just have no other recourse. They have to go through this same system like a guilty person has to. And it takes a long time and they're stonewalling or, you know, not, I can't say the state state stonewalling because they're not, but it just seems like it's just so hard. There's always another hill to climb. There's always another hurdle to have to, to jump over. And again, it's because it's not designed to be easy. You know, it's just very unfortunate. And that's why I've said a million times, this is why conviction integrity units are necessary and why they've had so much success with them in other cities that have designed them because it offers a different avenue for those who are wrongfully convicted because if a conviction integrity unit decides a case doesn't have merit or that there's something wrong with it they can just drop the charges the next day and the person can be let out you can't do that in the appellate system it's just not how it works yeah okay so we were saying before yeah you don't want to you don't jump to conclusions we don't know what they have and what they don't have we know that the documentation certainly calls it into question but until it's hashed out in court, we really can't say for sure what they have, what they don't have. Because again, we know that their documentation is crappy. So it would not surprise me at all if they don't have things that they thought they did and that they do things that they didn't think they did, do have things that they didn't think they did because, oh my God, they're terrible. Uh, why would they give Hallbox bird bones? Well, that's another thing Kathleen's pointing out here. Um, the fact that they use the only human or the human only human notation, she's trying to say that, well, Fallon then either knew that they were Hallbox and she specifically says, was there some testing done that I'm not aware of? Because how else would you know that those were Teresa's bones and give them to her family unless there was more testing done? Because that certainly wasn't done for the trial. So that's one of the things she brings up. She's like, okay, fill me in here. Was there more testing? Because how did you know that these were Teresa's bones to give them to the family? Because why would you give her bones that weren't hers or might not be hers? In some cases, might not even be human, might be animal bones. Why would you do that? Yeah, Fallon should know. And again, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that maybe he doesn't remember specifically which ones because, not kidding, I forget things from one day to the next. So, but he, he should, there's no way he could, can't remember that they did, that they, they gave away something. In which case, I would think that he would double check before he agrees to any testing or anything else. And if he didn't, well, that's on him, but he certainly checked by now. The minute that those two pages from the case report were added to that motion and the motion came out, you bet he double checked to see what's there and what's not. And the fact that he's not responding to me is very telling. Does the voicemail prove they lied about possession of the bone? Well, that's a little bit of a gray area because like I said, we don't know if Fallon lied or if he, again, just wasn't thorough. You know, if he didn't, if he didn't remember or he didn't double check that they, that that was one of the bones they gave away. So we don't really know that he flat out lied about it because it, it doesn't make sense to me that he lied. 
Because like I said, when they made that agreement, if Kathleen had immediately notified the court of that agreement, the decision would not have come down and that testing would have had to happen. So I'm thinking that he just didn't check, you know, and that he didn't think that was one of the ones they gave away. He was careless, which again is something that is very prevalent in this case. You know, so, but once she filed the motion, if he didn't know, he checked. But he's not under any obligation to disclose that right now because right. that's not the motion in front of the court. Obviously, the best way to argue against the remand is to say, wait a minute, we have all those bones. Okay, so no, not an issue. We don't need to remand this. And they didn't do that. Right. So again, right. that suggests that they, they tried to argue it on procedural grounds. So right. that suggests they don't have them. Mark has a good question. I don't know where it is. Oh, Mark, I just saw it. I, oh, I just answered it, right? Yeah, I just answered that one. It doesn't prove that they lied. It's just it's a little. Like I said, I actually don't find the phone call that shocking. I just think it's hilarious that he called the wrong person. You know, and it's, again, that inept and that incompetent that you can't even make the right a phone call to the correct person. And even after you call and something picks up on the other end, you're still not aware that you're not talking to the person or the voicemail, the person you're supposed to be calling. That's what's weird or just crazy about it to me. But what he said is, you know, we're not going to respond until we check. Well, that's the smart thing to do. So I don't find the call itself that scandalous. It's just the fact that, you know. It's the fact that uh, Fallon is clearly trying to avoid answering. <laughs> and we don't know what the discussion was between uh, Williams and Fallon earlier. Obviously, at some point, Fallon had to say, hey, she's emailing me. Fallon could have told him then. We don't have it. And Williams could be responding in this voicemail by saying, well, let's check first. It's not clear what Williams knows during this voicemail. He could have already been told by Fallon that they don't have it. And it would have been nice if he would have said that on the voicemail. But he's just saying, well, let's just check before we respond in any way. So that doesn't really give any clue whether he knows or doesn't know at that point or what Fallon has told him at that point. If the motion goes from the motions judge to a panel, do we have any idea who the panel might be made of? Yeah, because, well, first of all, I can pretty much guarantee it's going to a panel. No, no, no motion that's in front of a single judge would probably would take. I shouldn't say that it's most likely gone to a, a panel because this is a long time for a one judge decision. Now, granted, every time Kathleen files something, they could take it into consideration, but they've had plenty of, plenty of opportunity to rule in between the filings. Um, so I think it's gone to a panel. It has to go to the three judges that, um, that are gonna hear the case, and that would be Hagedorn and Neubauer and Riley. Because again, Mark Gundrum is the only other judge in. Um, in that uh, district, and he can't he can't hear anything with with Steve's case. That's not been officially said, but it has to be the case. I mean, he personally knew Steve. He worked with him on the Avery bill. He he can't. I mean, even if he thinks he can be objective, even if the court thinks he can be objective, it's perception. The reason they recuse themselves is because of perception, and it would be perceived very badly if somebody that actually had a personal relationship with Steve was ruling on his case. So, he, and that would mean he can't have anything to do with any rulings on the case at all. Again, it hasn't been said, but I don't see how they can see it any other way. Doesn't the tibia bone have lots of value? They gave that back to the family, which was found in the barrel too. Well, any bones they gave away can have potential value, but it was only the pelvic bone that we know. There's documented proof that it was important to the defense, and there's documented proof that even Fallon said in his own words that it was relevant, that that, the, that bone was relevant and worth testing, and he could understand why she wanted to test it. We don't have that kind of documentation with the other bones, so that's why it's a lot harder to win any arguments about bad faith in those, because again, state can simply say like, well, you never asked to test these, but this, this tibia bone before, how are we supposed to know all of a sudden you're gonna decide it's important? It's never been brought up, not in the trial, pre-trial, pre trial, post-conviction, direct appeal, collateral review. Never been brought up. Can't say that with pelvic bone. That's why it's so important. Um, is it worth them trawling the quarry again? Could there be anything left? Yeah, never say never, but 
you know, I doubtful, <laughs> but you never know. Um, I think Casey say that in her Q and A. Yeah, actually, I think I do remember. Yeah, I mean, I said I, it's a long shot. It's a long shot. It's been a lot of time, but you know, like I said never say never. You never know. It's always worth looking, I guess. They turned every okay. So what are you saying? So should she have known these things she's finding existed, or was she under the assumption that an up in DNA's office turned everything over? Okay. Well, this is this is complicated. When we're when the outside supporters are doing FOIA requests, we're requesting documents that are up to date, current. Okay. Steve's previous counsel only had documents up until the time that she represented him. If you want anything else that has happened since then, you have to file a motion for post-conviction discovery. That was never filed. Okay, Kathleen just took the files from the, the attorney. She never filed anything for post-conviction discovery. But I know that she and Fallon had a pretty decent relationship at one time about just deciding things behind the scenes. So there could be some agreement behind the scenes that she's saying, yeah, can you give me this or this? Because again, you want to try to keep the court out of it as much as possible. You don't want to hash this out in front of the court because the court just gets irritated. Like, stop acting like children and, and figure this out. So it's possible they could have had some kind of deal, you know, behind the scenes, just like they did with the testing. So remember way back then, and everyone was freaking out about how she was only allowed to do certain testing. And I kept telling people, I said, no, I said, this is fine. I guarantee you she wasn't wanting all of it. I bet they're doing it in stages. And then sure enough, Months later, when the decision comes out and then she files the motion to vacate, talking about this agreement, she says, we decided we were going to do this testing in stages. But again, we didn't know that for sure. Well, I kind of did, but she, we didn't know that for sure until she said it. So we don't always know what agreements are going on behind the scenes. So we can't say that she didn't ask for these things. We really don't know. Um, there could have been an expectation that they were going to keep her up to date with some of the with some of the stuff. But now this isn't like the case where she didn't have the last two pages. She did have the evidence ledgers. It's just that when it came to these bones, it stopped. The recording of the evidence got stopped in 2006. There's an entire page missing, and I believe there were four entries after that that were not included in her copy of the logs, including Mark Weir removing it from evidence to, you know, we're supposedly handed over to the funeral home, even though it's not noted that they did that. Again, don't get that. So that's why some of the things that we've requested are more up to date than what she has. And um, I, I'm sure that she's, she's been doing some comparisons now to make sure that she has what we have and, and uh, maybe making even additional FOIA requests behind the scenes to say like, okay, well, now you're going to send me the most up-to-date stuff you have. And she honestly shouldn't have to do it to be a FOIA request. She should just be able to ask for it. But, you know, sometimes it's a lot easier that way. Um, is anyone considering possible setup here from Fallon to make Casey look like a fool when they know, show that they still have the public ones? No. Oh, well, why would anybody do that? She doesn't look like a fool. She's going by the documentation that's there. She doesn't know what she doesn't know. You know, so she's not the one that would look bad. They look bad. They look bad for having documentation saying they get rid of it. And then also they say we have it. Well, again, it just makes them look incompetent. It doesn't make her look incompetent. So no, that would not even be a thing. Thanks, Christine. Um, What is the longest time for the time frame? We mean for the motion. There is no set time for the motion. Um, if they remand the case, you know, it can take a long time. It took several months for the CD, and that wasn't even, there was no hearing even granted in that case. So it can take a while. Yeah, it's, it's not always 15 years. I know Kathleen keeps saying that because I think she's trying to just prepare people that it could be a while. But obviously, you know, it can go quicker than that. Um, but it could easily go a couple more years for sure. Because again, even if Steve is granted a hearing, 
Um, obviously, even if he gets a hearing and that could take six months to complete, and then we still have to wait for the judge's decision. So it could even be longer than that. And even if it rules in Steve's favor, if the judge rules, Judge Suckowitz, I know, long shot, but if she rules that there was a constitutional violation, the state can appeal that decision and then we're right back in the Court of Appeals for another year, year and a half. You know, so, I mean, it, it can still take a while. Okay, we're gonna talk about the pardons. <laughs> Julie, he's gonna bring up the pardons. I've been in debates about Wisconsin's pardon eligibility requirements. I know a pardon isn't what KZ will consider, but I'm under the impression that Stephen isn't eligible for a pardon. Can you settle this debate, please? Okay, <laughs> once and for all. First off, okay, everybody's using pardon and clemency interchangeably. They're not. Clemency is sort of the umbrella on which things like a pardon and sentence commutation fall under. In Wisconsin, in order to apply for a pardon, you need to have been a felon, you need to have served your sentence, and it usually, it has, well, it, by the old, the last governor that allowed pardons, the rule was that I believe it was, I knew at the time, I think five years, before you could even apply for a pardon. Because essentially a pardon, what a pardon does is it restores your right, certain rights. Okay, your right to own a firearm, your right to run to, for office, your right, you know, your right to vote, all that. So if you're an extended, like, parole or supervision and you're still not able to do that, getting a pardon can restore those rights. It does not exonerate you. It is not an exoneration. Okay, so if either of the guys accepted a well again, we'll get to it, but just if they accepted clemency, they would still be convicted felons. Brendan would still have to register as a sex offender. It is not the same. They would be no wrongful conviction lawsuits. There is no such thing as, you know, being a civil lawsuit when you basically admitted that you're guilty. That's what it is. It's it's like an Alfred plea, but almost worse because you can't maintain your innocence. What the guys would actually be uh, applying for would be a sentence commutation. Um, there's been no, there's nothing in the statutes about there being this full executive clemency where your record is expunged. No, not a thing in Wisconsin. Now every governor has the opportunity to kind of play along. Uh, there's a lot of room in the statutes, like the, the waiting period. That is something that's not defined by statute. Um, that's something that a governor can decide. But the other stuff is by statute. So if you are an incarcerated, currently incarcerated prisoner, you can apply for sentence commutation. If you want to apply for a pardon, you need, and even then you need a waiver. You need a special waiver. And what they do, and this is the, the hard part, okay, they have to send notifications to the victim, or in this case, it would be the victim's family, to the DA, the opposing DA in the case, and um, even the judge. And they can all weigh in on what they think about this per person being pardoned or being even considered for pardoning. And if they're applying for a waiver and they submit, you know, ask those people, do you think they're gonna say, okay, yeah, sure, great, no. And the pardoning board has it already it said like, again in the old application um, it said that they give that a great amount of weight. They do. Um, obviously, they worry about public public safety things like that about whether somebody's sentence should be commuted and they should be released early. And again, this is the time when I say like you people like anybody who doesn't live here doesn't get it. Like, no governor is going to pardon these guys. Not with the state of what people think um, that think the guys are guilty in this state. It's just, it's not going to be a thing. I mean, I'm sorry. I wish I could say it would be, but I, I don't. But again, technically we're talking about as an umbrella, clemency, and then sentence commutation. Pardons is actually for people who actually have been released already and um, have demonstrated that they have been a productive member of society and have earned the right to um, get some of their rights restored early. Essentially is all it is. And I know that people are completely, because sometimes in some places they'll say a pardon is like expungement. No, not in Wisconsin. At least not now. They'd have to change the legislature. The legislature would have to change that. Um, but what this governor will do, who knows? I mean, he's got, he gets to set up his own rules, but I don't think he's going to shake the boat or rock the boat that much. It would be the same type of thing. Okay.
Mark, I have no idea what part you left at. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, yeah, I had said today, I was like, well, it'd be great if she filed a motion saying that the Hallbox finally were like, hey, we'll, we'll just do independent testing of these bones because we want to know if they belong to our daughter or not. But, you know, a girl can dream. I'm looking at my crystal ball when he's going to get released. Yeah, I wish. Uh, would she have um, committed an ethical violation? Whether technically it's an ethical violation, um, I'm not real sure. It's her voicemail. It's her voicemail. She can just kind of, she can share with anybody she wants. Um, but we're also talking about an ethics board that evaluated the press conference and said there's nothing wrong with it. So I highly doubt she needs to worry about anything. Um, so yeah, I mean, in general, it's her voicemail, so. I don't really know though. I've never, I haven't really looked at the the, the ethics laws that closely lately um, to see specifically if they say anything about um, any type of communication between attorneys. Um, do we know if the Hallbox requested the bones or the state offered them to them? I, I, we don't know, but my guess would be that the family asked because the state probably wouldn't just volunteer to give them something unless the state, unless the family was saying, hey, you know, like, can we get her remains? Um, you know, because a lot of families, they would want, they would want that. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it says in case so that it was stored in a plastic bag. Um, I'll read through the ones that are more detailed, but I'm just looking for questions right now. Julie, you're the winner. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. The report indicates that the human bones from ATSA were separated from the non-human bones. You're right. They say that in the case of report. They say they separated the human bones and photographed them, but they don't say, well, what did, was it just the human bones you gave them? Did you give them all of them? Did you put the human bones back in evidence? What did you do with those human bones? And that's why in the evidence ledger, you know, maybe that's why Kathleen didn't pay too much attention to that. But in the evidence ledger, when it says only human, you know, then that she's like, well, wait a minute, here you're saying that you took only the human bones out. And at first I thought maybe they were referencing what they said in, the, in Queso, that they were removing the human bones to photograph them. But in every other place in the ledger, whenever they took something out just to view it and put it back, they made a note of that. But they also made a note when they gave everything, you know, when other evidence was disposed of. This is why documentation is important to everyone except for Calumet County, apparently. Yeah, uh, Williams is probably pretty embarrassed right now. <laughs> I'm sure. I wonder at what point, I wonder if he realized it. Like, or did he just, I don't know. I mean, like, did he just like not know until she filed this that he did that? Or did he like, oh crap, like right after he hung up and start panicking? I want to know, just for my own amusement. Okay, I think we're to the end pretty much. I don't really talk about my theories. Of course I have them, but I don't really talk about them. You know, I don't, I don't actually, I don't, um, somebody asked what my theory is about what happened to, uh, to, to Teresa. Um, and I don't, I don't talk about it too much. I just, I don't really spend a lot of time theorizing. I look at facts. I look at things that do make sense and don't make sense. And the one thing I'll say to everybody, okay, as somebody who has done a lot of investigative work in, in, in the past, you know a theory is good when you can't disprove it. If you want to be a good theorist, do everything you can to disprove it. Disprove it yourself. If you can't disprove it, then it's a good theory. The minute you start adding a bunch of, well, if this happened, if that happened, if that did, you know, okay, stop. <laughs> Just stop. Okay, it's already gone off the rails. Stick to the facts as much as possible. Try not to put too much speculation into it. Apply logic as often as possible, even though sometimes crimes, crimes are completely illogical. Leave room for the illogical or the weird or the bizarre or the crazy. Leave room for it. But still, always try to disprove it. Because 
if you just if you can just prove it or you have way too many yeah but i don't think that or whatever you know scrap it and start over that's my word of advice on theories <laughs> and i'm still i still don't say what mine is the only thing i can say is that i believe that there is a miscarriage of justice here that's the only thing i will say for sure but who killed her and how and why and i don't believe she was burned in the back of the garage that much i will say because <laughs> i've been there and oh my god that's one thing that always bothered me. I'm just going to throw this out there one there is that the state actually wanted to go to the salvage yard for the trial, take the jury out there. And it was the defense that didn't want to do it. And not only did they not want them to go to the salvage yard, they specifically said they didn't want them to go back by the trailer. And that just blows my mind. I have been at the salvage yard, obviously when I went the first time myself, but I've been there with a lot, a lot of different times when there have been other people there. And that's the first thing everybody mentions. It's like, oh my God, that's so close. And that garage, it's like, it's a particle board garage. You're talking about flames eight feet high. Oh my God. Like Bear's doghouse would have been melted. There would be scor there's no scorch marks on that garage at all. I mean, it would have went up in flames. So I, I really have never understood why the defense was opposed to the jury seeing that. Same thing with the Pam of God, God walk. You know, if it takes 10 minutes for a person to walk just normally, how could Pam have found it, the grab in less than 20 minutes when she was supposedly searching rows and rows of cars while she was going? Again, it, it's just like, let the jury see, they should let the jury see that and be like, yeah, there's no way. She knew this was here. I, it, it just kind of baffles me why they didn't want that. The only thing I could think of is because of the bus driver, because they wanted to give that impression. They knew that that van never moved. The defense did. They knew that Teresa was never up at the corner taking pictures, but that's what the bus driver testified to. Because trust me, I've been there plenty of times when people said, oh, the bus driver would never see her down here. I'm like, well, that's not what the bus driver said. She said she saw Teresa up here and the defense knew that that was not possible. So they wanted maybe people to think that, you know, like she saw her where she actually was. And if you go to the salvage yard, you can see it's impossible. There's no way anybody could see anybody taking pictures from that part of the road where the roads meet. And then you go down by Steve's trailer. No way anybody could ever see that. Don't care how good your eyes are. So maybe that's why, but it's always bothered me because I think that you look at that burn pit and you look at the garage and, and that propane tank and it's like, nope. Okay, I think we're about done. Again, longer than I thought. I never think I'm going to talk this much, and I do. I'm blaming justice for distracting me. Okay, that's about it. Obviously, um, I'll get to quite more questions later, so feel free to keep adding them if you like. But other than that, that's it. Everybody have a good night. Thanks.